Tonight, breaking news. There are mixed reports tonight. Is the Manhattan District Attorney signaling criminal charges could be likely for former President Trump? NBC News confirming prosecutors are calling on Trump to testify if he wants before a grand jury in a case related to that hush money payment made to adult film star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. We'll have a live report and analysis straight ahead. Also tonight, the surprising move from the cartel issuing a handwritten apology and turning in their own goons for kidnapping a group of Americans and killing two of them as the bodies of those killed are returned to the U.S. tonight. This just in a mass shooting reported at a church in Germany. Multiple people killed. The late breaking details coming in. Back here at home, fight or flight, a brawl breaking out in the aisle of a Southwest plane moments before takeoff. This after a man on a different flight stabbed the flight attendant after trying to open an emergency door. That scene coming just days after another man stabbed the flight attendant or the judge ruled about his case in court today. In Washington tonight, Senator Mitch McConnell hospitalized with a concussion after tripping and hitting his head. How long the minority leader is expected to be out of commission and what this could mean for critical budget negotiations on the Hill. Plus, off the rails, the president of Norfolk Southern grilled by lawmakers over a, a string of toxic train derailments. The latest happening while he was testifying. And good evening. We want to get right to that late breaking news that's just happened here on Top Story. Mixed reports coming in about whether or not Manhattan's prosecutors are signaling former President Trump could soon be facing criminal charges related to hush money payments made to adult actress Stormy Daniels. That news first reported by the New York Times. I want to bring in NBC News justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian and NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett. Ken, I'm going to start with you. And no, we're telling our viewers here, we're being very transparent. There's a little bit of mixed reporting tonight. All of this information has just come in, so I want you to sort of clarify where we are on our reporting. The New York Times has a headline out tonight signaling that prosecutors say, say criminal charges possibly are likely for former President Trump because they're asking him if he wants to testify in front of a grand jury, which usually signals that criminal charges could be coming. We have some different reporting. Get us up to speed right now. Good evening, Tom. Well, actually, NBC News has confirmed that Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg has invited the former president to testify before the grand jury that's been investigating this hush money payment matter. And that is a sign, generally, in the New York system that charges are imminent. It's equivalent to getting a target letter in the federal system. It's what, happened to it's what happens to defendants shortly before they're indicted. It's very unlikely that Donald Trump would be able to testify. He would be opening himself up to too much jeopardy. But New York generally grants a defendant one last chance to tell their story before they are charged. And let's remember what this case is. It's a case involving a $130,000 payment made to the foreign actress known as Stormy Daniels back in 2016. And, and the charges here are based on the premise that that payment was not properly accounted for under New York, New York state law within the Trump organization. And that would be a misdemeanor, but to elevate it to a felony, uh, it, it would have to be in concert with another crime. And, and the potential crime there is, is an improper campaign contribution. This $130,000 could be seen as a campaign contribution to Donald Trump because he was running for president at the time, and he wanted to tamp down on this story that he was uh, allegedly having an affair with this porn actress, which, by the way, he denies. And so that's the theory. It's also important to note here that the federal government, the Southern District of Manhattan, in investigated this case thoroughly, and they charged former Trump lawyer Michael Cohen in a document that laid out some of the conduct of uh, then-President Trump, who was called in that document Individual One. But they decided not to, well, they couldn't charge Trump while he was president under Justice Department doctrine. But even after he left office, that office took a look and decided not to charge former President Trump. They decided this case was not strong enough. So Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan DA, should he bring this case, is taking a big risk. It would also be a momentous, momentous uh, uh, decision to charge a former president. And it could be the first of actually several charges. There are two other pending investigations involving former President Trump. All right, Ken, I also want to point out some new NBC News reporting we have here from Trump's own attorneys who are saying this. 
Two of Trump's defense attorneys tell NBC News that former President Donald Trump has been told through his attorneys that he can appear before the grand jury. But here's what they say is different. Contrary to the New York Times reporting, according to these sources, he was not told that criminal charges could be forthcoming. I want to turn now to Laura Jarrett, who's joining us now. Ken touched upon all the different sort of crimes that may or may not have been yeah. committed here at the law. It's very complicated. Yeah. This is not going to be an easy case to prove. Just to walk people through this again, the two charges here involve former President Trump paying Michael Cohen, right, saying they were legal fees. Reimbursing Michael Reimbursing Cohen. him, saying yeah. they were legal fees, but they weren't legal fees. So that is considered fraud, a misdemeanor. They yes. could elevate it to felony, but it's going to take some time. On top of that, they want to marry that to another law that was possibly broken, that by Michael Cohen paying Stormy Daniels, that $130,000, it was a hush money payment. That's actually not illegal. You can do that. Yeah. What's illegal is that President Trump was running at the time for office, so he violated a campaign law. So you don't need wanna, me at all. No, You've I got all the you. law. I didn't yeah. But here's the thing. Can they marry those two laws together? Because that seems complicated. It's super complicated. It's untested. It's a novel legal theory. And this is why so many people, I think, have looked at this case as sort of if you're going to bring a case against the former president of the United States, is this the best vehicle to do that? Because of all the reasons you laid out. Normally, it would be a misdemeanor, falsifying business records. Misdemeanor doesn't mean it's not a serious criminal charge, but it's a misdemeanor. And kind of a question of, is it small potatoes? Is it worth going after the former president when he's been facing so much other scrutiny for his business records? Something that may seem more elevated. But as you point out, you can elevate it to a felony. So we're talking about jail time here, at least I think four years in prison. But to do that, you'd have to tack on this other violation of an election law. And it seems like a roundabout way to do it. And so the question whether is, is that really the best use of the prosecutor's time and discretion here? Now, of course, the Trump camp denies all of this. And they say that this is just a, a political hit job on him. Um, but it's worth noting that, you know, the, the district attorney here has faced a fair amount of scrutiny for not having right. pursued other cases against Trump. And in his discretion, just decided over he did, tax fraud. Over tax yeah. fraud. And he decided he could couldn't make out that case and he didn't pursue it. Um, and someone wrote a whole book about why he should have. But uh, it appears as though this has reached an advanced stage. And so they can quibble, the president's the lawyer, former president's lawyers can quibble about whether or not this signals that a criminal charge is near. But it clearly signals that the prosecutors have reached an advanced stage. We know that they have brought a litany of other witnesses into the grand jury. And typically you wouldn't go after um, someone at a high yeah. level at this stage unless you were prepared to indict. And, and Alvin Bragg, we should point out for our viewers, is somebody who runs for office. Office. You yeah. have to you have to be elected to become the district attorney of Manhattan. I do want to ask you, Trump's attorneys are pushing back on the New York Times reporting, saying, listen, they just invited him to testify before the grand jury. They're not signaling any criminal charges. But if they're asking you traditionally, historically, yeah. to testify in front of the grand jury, it's essentially your last chance to say, I'm innocent. I didn't commit these crimes. Don't indict me, correct? Yes. And, and New York law is a little bit funky here. And in other places, it's not always the case that they do that. But New York law, they let you sort of have that one last shot. At, at testifying. Now, I cannot imagine a circumstance in which we will see Donald Trump enter that courthouse to testify because if he takes the stand, he doesn't get to claim immunity. He doesn't get to take the fifth, so to speak. He'd actually have to testify honestly and frankly about everything he knows about that. And they may, may not be something he wants to do and open himself up to criminal exposure. So let me ask you, because you know the world of politics, you know the world of law. These are going to sort of intersect because I'm, I wrote a note down here, 2024. I mean, we're getting closer and closer to the primary calendar. Yeah. I think the debates start in August. What's going to happen here? What, well, what, what, I mean, will judges take this into consideration? Will the appellate courts take this into consideration? They're not supposed to, but, you know, it's, it's just a question of reality that we're yeah. all living in. Again, we're in sort of untested waters. We've never seen the former president of the United States under a criminal indictment. And we should be clear, it's not there yet. They yeah. haven't charged him with anything. He can deny this, as he has continued to do, and I'm sure will do, and say that he's innocent of any of these charges. But if they do charge him in the midst of a political season, it will obviously cause a fair amount amount of, you know, confusion and, and speculation about what it all means. And it's certainly something on the minds of federal prosecutors, as you have seen the attorney general appoint a special prosecutor for this very reason, recognizing the extraordinary circumstances we find ourselves in to have the former president under such scrutiny. And, and there's a whole conversation you can have about politics and whether this is going to hurt the president, former president, or help him, because yeah. it may empower him with some supporters. Ken, before we go, I do want to ask you for one more question. I know grand juries, they operate in secrecy. Do we have any kind of idea on a timeline on What's next? And I understand from some of the reporting that I'm reading, the most he could get possibly if he was convicted is four years. So we're not talking about a ton of prison time if we even get to that level. 
I think that's correct. I, I, we can only intuit and read the tea leaves that the timeline is accelerated here, that, that apparently they're asking him to come in next week. And so, it, you know, if it goes as other cases have gone, an indictment could be imminent, like within weeks. And, but you're absolutely right. This is not a terribly strong case. It's not a very serious set of criminal charges, particularly compared to what Donald Trump may be facing down in Georgia uh, with the case down there and also with special counsel Jack Smith, who is investigating obviously what happened in January 6th, as well as Donald Trump's retention of classified documents. But, and actually, I just thought of one more question for you, Laura. <laughs> the genie's out of the bottle here. Alvin Bragg, at this point, it's going to be very hard for him to, to hit the brakes, right? I mean, it would seem somewhat embarrassing if they go through this through all the way through here and they don't do anything, right? Yeah, I mean, there's the show, the this famous saying is that if you're going to take a shot at the king, you don't miss. Right, right? from it's the wire, a, yeah. You don't, you don't go this far down the line in a historic prosecution uh, if you're not prepared to indict. Now, of course, the district attorney's office this night is declining to comment. Okay. Laura Jarifras, Ken Delaney on this breaking story that's just coming in. We appreciate both your reporting and your analysis. We do want to move on now to another major story tonight, the stunning twist in the cartel kidnappings we've been following closely. Days after four Americans were brutally taken at gunpoint, two of them killed, we're hearing from the cartel for the first time. Yes, from the cartel. The group releasing this image showing the five men that they say are responsible for the attack. Yes, they gave up their own men, a group that they are describing as rogue actors. You can see them there with their shirts pulled over their heads, their hands tied, the type of image we are accustomed to seeing from a violent drug ring. But left on the windshield of the vehicle, something we are not used to seeing whatsoever, a handwritten apology note. In that letter, the cartel writing, we respect the life, tranquility, and integrity of the innocent. The guilty parties will pay regardless of who they are. Those innocent lives, of course, two Americans who were killed, the other two who were kidnapped with them returned alive. One Mexican national also killed in the crossfire. The cartel apologized for that killing as well. And just moments ago, the bodies of the dead, you see them in this van return to the U.S. Despite this stunning act of violence, the president of Mexico today rejecting calls for the U.S. military to intervene, saying such a move would be irresponsible. Morgan Chesky is on the American side of the border tonight with all these new developments. The stunning photos show five men laying on the pavement, each with hands tied and all but one shirtless, with a handwritten letter claiming to be from Mexico's Gulf Cartel stuck to the windshield. A bizarre scene that tonight a senior law enforcement official tells NBC News appears to be an apology from the cartel following the kidnapping that left two Americans dead. The shocking admission almost unprecedented. Have you seen a PR? situation like this no i have not they made a huge mistake uh they killed uh, two americans and uh they know that the uh, mexican government going after them they know that we're going to go after them as, as as well the letter obtained by the associated press from a mexican official includes apologies to the people of matamoros the mexican woman who was killed and the families of the Americans. It reads in part, the Gulf Cartel Scorpion Group strongly condemns the events of Friday, March 3rd. For this reason, we have decided to hand over those involved, adding the men acted under their own determination and undisciplined and against the rules in which the cartel has always operated. Mexican authorities have not confirmed if the men are in custody or if they're truly responsible. Meanwhile, in Texas, as officials work to get two slain Americans back home, Survivor Eric James Williams is recovering. His wife sharing doctors placed metal rods in his leg, wounded in the hail of gunfire. Tonight, the cartel ending their letter, asking society to remain calm, closing with the guilty parties will pay, regardless of who they are. All right, Morgan Chesky joins us tonight from Brownsville, Texas. We can see the border crossing there just behind you. Morgan, I want to go back to something that you reported in your story. You and your team witnessing that van carrying those Americans who died in this attack crossing back into U.S. soil. Tom, that's right. Our crew witnessed the transfer of those two Americans from Mexico back to the United States. This was a process that had been uh, going for some time now. We do know that it's headed to a funeral home here in Brownsville, Texas, uh, and arrangements, however, with the families have yet to be made. Tom? You know, Morgan, this is a very strange case. Every day there's a new twist that we can't believe, this latest twist with the cartel admitting to this and giving up the alleged gunman. W where does the investigation go from here? 
That's on the FBI says right now Mexican authorities are cooperating. So the first order of business uh, on behalf of federal authorities is verify these men are actually tied to this kidnapping crime. If so, the U.S. Justice Department is within their rights to request extradition because of their potential involvement with the deaths of U.S. citizens. Tom. All right, Morgan Chesky with all those new developments for us. Morgan, we thank you for that. For more on this bizarre behavior from the cartel and this apology letter, which we've never seen before, I'm joined now by former FBI agent uh, who also worked against working against the Mexican cartels on the border, Robert D'Amico. Agent D'Amico, we thank you so much for joining us here on Top Story. I want to first start with that letter. In all your years working with the FBI and working against the cartels, ha have you ever seen anything like this, this, this apology letter? I haven't personally seen one, but I, I do know that uh, the intel says, especially the, the cartels in the Northeast, do do this. Um, but it does remind me of the American mafia. Like, when you look at how these groups operate, the people within the communities give them security. Uh, they tell them, they tip them off. So they actually understand a lot that having the people more on their side helps them. It helps them in the long run. I, I'm surprised at the letter. I, to a point, I figured they were going to kill the gunmen because the gunmen are just employees. Um, I, I figured they're going to kill them and get rid of them that way. And they actually did a smarter move by turning them over. Uh, they know that the American uh, FBI is going to find out who is involved and come up with indictments. If they could get them out of the way early, it takes them out of the picture, especially the leaders. Yeah, so I wanna... if we want to go for... I want to ask you about that a little bit later because it's sort of strange. They, they almost are the law in that town. But I, I want to ask you that uh, in a moment. First, I want to ask you, though, is, is there an unspoken code? Is there some type of law within this lawless group? Because it sounds from the apology letter like these men broke some kind of rule. There's always laws within these, these groups. So whatever groups you're dealing with, be it motorcycle gangs, American mafia, uh, even an intelligence organization, there's inside rules. There's inside baseball and these cartel guys, they made that mistake, um, and the cartel's blaming them. Now, again, what were their orders uh, when they went after them? Was it, was it the, were they told no or something like that? Probably not, but they're blaming them. They're saying, hey, you guys went over and above what we told you could do, uh, maybe got a little zealous and, and did something, and it's coming down on them. But even if they didn't, the, the leaders are going to blame them. They're going to take everything off, off themselves. They're going to say, hey, they were acting on their own. They, they weren't. It's an enterprise. They operate this way. Um, so I, I think, again, the leadership of the cartel is trying to get the pressure off them and giving up five, six gunmen is not going to hurt them in the long run. So, you know, we talked about this video when it came out on Monday. We kind of walked, you walked me through it moment by moment, frame by frame, if you will. And, and one of the interesting things we pointed out was that the cars just sort of stopped in traffic here, right? These men were armed to the T. They had their bulletproof jackets on. They were throwing the bodies in the back of the pickup truck. If we can roll that video once again so people could see what I'm talking about. The question I have for you is that if these gunmen were never turned over, if, if the gang, the cartel didn't turn in their own men, do you think Matamoros police, the Mexican National Police, would have ever turned them in as well? Uh, not, not local police. I, I think it would have taken a whole bunch of effort from the U.S. government to the Mexican federal government side to get them turned over. It would have been a lot of pressure. And, and again, the cartel smartly said, hey, we'll package them up, we'll give them to you, leave us alone. And that's what the letter's about. It's not sincere. They're not sorry. They kill hundreds of people a year. They're sorry they got caught. They're sorry it happened. They're sorry they got bad press. And that's why they're doing this. They're doing it to relieve the pressure on them. How, what do you think this does for the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico? There have been a lot of people who have called for sort of U.S. intervention, if you will, to act against the cartels because people make the argument that they are terrorist organizations, right? They, they traffic guns. They traffic human beings. They traffic children. Uh, they commit all types of atrocities. They've taken over many cities in Mexico, as we saw here in Matamoros. What do you think this does with the relationship? Because we heard from the president of Mexico, right, who's pushed back against any calls for the U.S. to assist with the country's ongoing feud here, and he addressed this today as well. Yeah, he, he definitely doesn't want to look, uh, he wants to look strong for his people. He doesn't want the U.S. coming in. Uh, that looks bad on him. Uh, he wants to say, hey, we can solve these problems. It's just bringing to light what the cartels do. It, you know, there, there's been a lot of series in a, it, on, on TV and stuff. It's like the American mafia. When people look at it, like, oh, it looks cool on a, on a series, 
But when you really see the reality of it, it's not. It, people are dying. Uh, drugs are getting trafficked, uh, and, and people are getting trafficked. It's never been anything but that. They're just trying to come out with a better better image in that. So, again, they, they, and they may even have, like, a, a public relations firm. They hire professionals. There's a lot of money in it. They might have been told, hey, look, don't, don't kill them. Write a letter. We got to get out in front of this. It's just like any other corporation at a point. Okay, former FBI agent Robert D'Amigo. Robert, we always appreciate your time. We also have some breaking news overseas. Several people are dead and many more injured after a shooting at a church in Hamburg, Germany. For the late breaking details, I want to bring in NBC's Megan Fitzgerald, who's been covering this for us. She's been tracking it all tonight from London. Megan, tell us what you know. Well, Tom, what we know right now is that police are confirming that this shooting happened uh, just after 9 o'clock local time uh, when they say at least one or more suspects walked into this church, as you mentioned, in Hamburg, Germany. This is the second largest city in the state or in the country uh, and opened fire, killing multiple people, injuring several others. Uh, police are calling this a large scale operation here. They have taped off multiple uh, streets around the area as they search for answers. Uh, video coming into our newsroom showing the moments that this happened shortly after really uh, you see the gun the the uh, officers walking in with guns drawn heading into the church you can also see uh, several people leaving the church uh, it certainly suggests that there was some sort of event taking place inside uh, but at this point police have not confirmed how many people have died how many people are injured or if they were able to detain that one or other suspects that they believe committed uh, this crime here this is still a very active and ongoing investigation, Tom. Uh, we will continue to follow the latest. Okay, Megan Fitzgerald, following those late breaking details over there in London. Megan, we appreciate it. That was a shocking video on a Southwest Airlines flight from Dallas. A fight breaking out while the Phoenix bound flight was boarding. One passenger punching another while others tried to break up the fight. So, is anything being done about all these brawls in the air and unruly passengers? Juan Venegas has that story. Hey! Chaos in the cabin. No! Do not hit him again! This man in a tan leather jacket punching another passenger on a Southwest flight in Dallas on Monday while others attempt to stop him. The man seen here throwing punches, alleging the other passenger with tattoos seen here approached his family aggressively. Tell him what happened. Tell him what you did. I will sit down in jail for you approaching my family. Caitlin Johnson, who filmed the video, telling NBC News it was likely a simple bump that triggered the incident. The two Phoenix-bound Southwest passengers were removed from the plane and no arrests were made. Southwest Airlines declined to say if it's taking any further actions against the unruly passenger, saying in part, Nothing to share other than to say our flight crews are well-trained in de-escalation and we commend them for managing the situation. This video circulating as another unruly passenger involved in an incident on Sunday heads to court. I will kill every man on this plane. Francisco Torres accused of stabbing a flight attendant and trying to open an emergency exit door during a cross-country United flight from Los Angeles to Boston. Well, tell them to bring SWAT to shoot me down. A Boston federal judge deciding Torres will continue in detention pending a competency hearing. <gasps> According to the FAA, more than 40 unruly passengers are being reported every week. That's nowhere near the sky-high number we saw around this time last year, but still much higher than pre-pandemic trends. It's one too many incidents for industry professionals, including the famed captain who landed a plane on the Hudson River after the flight struck a flock of birds. Responding to that Boston incident, telling our Gotti Schwartz that a no-fly list is a good idea. I think part of the problem is that all the stressors, all the divisions in our society, many people bring on the airplane with them. And uh, if they're already stressed, it doesn't take too much more to, to set them off. The Association of Flight Attendants calling for federal intervention, saying in a statement, quote, we call on Congress to pass the Protection from Abusive Passengers Act. The legislation introduced by Representative Eric Swalwell and Senator Jack Reed would ban abusive passengers from commercial airline flights. This is legislation that has the Senate and the House behind it. It has Republicans and Democrats behind it. But the bill introduced last year has seen little forward movement in Congress. 
All right, Guad joins us tonight from Atlanta, outside the busiest airport in the country. And Guad, all these incidents come as the airline industry is dealing with another set of challenges. Those close calls on the runway we've been reporting on for weeks, even mid-air in some cases. What can you tell us about the safety summit that's coming up? Uh, Tom, that summit is going to be taking place March 15th. The head of the FAA says he wants to convene with people that represent regional and commercial air carriers, as well as airports and all sorts of aviation experts. The idea is for everyone to share what they've seen these last few months and also bring ideas to the table on how to enhance the safety net that we have in the U.S. Tom. All right, Guad Venegas for a squad. We appreciate it. From problems in the air to now the rails, another Norfolk Southern freight train derailing today, this one in Alabama. It happened as the company's CEO was testifying before Congress, facing tough questioning about that toxic derailment in Ohio five weeks ago. NBC's Tom Costello has more. I want to begin today by expressing how deeply sorry I am. Fully expecting a bipartisan grilling, Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw started with an apology and a promise. We're going to be there for as long as it takes to help East Palestine thrive and recover. That's my personal commitment. But when senators asked for specific commitments to cover residents' medical expenses for exposure to toxins and lost property value, the railroad exec kept it vague. Will you commit to paying for long-term medical testing for people in the impacted communities. Senator, I'm, I'm committed to doing what's right. Will you commit to compensating effective homeowners for their diminished property values? Senator, I'm committed to do what's right. Well, what's right is a family that had a home worth $100,000 that is now worth $50,000 will probably never be able to sell that home for 100000 again. Will you compensate that family for that loss? Senator, I'm committing to do what's right. That is the right thing to do. Shaw said the company has already pledged $21 million to help the area, insisting he runs a safe railroad. But as he was speaking, word of another Norfolk Southern derailment. 30 cars early this morning in Alabama. No injuries and no hazmat spill. Over the weekend, a Norfolk Southern train derailed in Springfield, Ohio. Again, no injuries. Also under fire for its response, the EPA. Why did it take weeks for the EPA administrator to drink the water he repeatedly told residents was safe? The EPA today did report that East Palestine air and water samples continue to test clean. Norfolk Southern has had 20 hazmat spills over eight years. The railroad industry averages one a month. Today, Ohio Republican J.D. Vance took aim at members of his own party who oppose new railroad safety regulations. We have a choice. Are we for big business and big government, or are we for the people of East Palestine? Shaw says he'd support parts of the new regs, but not all. Norfolk Southern runs a safe railroad. And it's my commitment to improve that safety. Tom, right now, 18 lawsuits have been filed by the residents of East Palestine against Norfolk Southern. Now, the EPA insists it will hold the company accountable. If it fails to completely clean up the area, the EPA is threatening to force it to pay triple the costs of the cleanup there. Tom? Tom Costell, for us, we want to stay in Washington now. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell remains hospitalized with a concussion tonight after a fall at a Washington, D.C. hotel. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has been following this for us. Ryan, you know, usually if a lawmaker slips and falls, it's not major news, but we're talking about a serious injury here to Senator McConnell. Yeah, that's right, Tom. It's serious enough where his staff is saying that he is expected to spend several days in the hospital and they're not setting a timeline for his return. Now, despite that bleak outlook, there is every expectation that he'll make a full recovery. In fact, President Biden was asked about McConnell tonight. Uh, keep in mind that they have a long relationship because of Biden's lengthy stay here in the United States Senate where he worked with Mitch McConnell. He said that he reached out to McConnell's family and was told uh, that McConnell will be all right. But as of right now, we don't have a lot of information uh, about his health status other than that he's currently being hospitalized and that uh, they are not ready to say exactly when he'll be able to come back to work. Ryan, talk to me about the machinations in the Senate right now. And I asked this 
because we, we have a few senators now who, who are, aren't able to work because of illnesses. We have Senator John Fetterman, of course, from Pennsylvania, who's being treated for depression. Senator Dianne Feinstein from Shingles, uh, for Shingles from California. Now we have Senator McConnell, who, who's hit his head and has this concussion now. How is this impacting the overall work of the Senate? It's really a, a question about the length of McConnell's absence as to just how big of an impact it'll have on the U.S. Senate. In the short term, it's probably not that big of a deal. As you point out, there are two Democrats missing. Now there's one Republican missing. There are tight margins here in the Senate, but it likely won't change the outcome of any pending legislation. The bigger problem for Republicans and for McConnell is if he is out for an extended period of time, he is in charge of the negotiations for Senate Republicans, and there are a number of major issues that that have to be hashed out here over the next couple of months. There's a looming debt ceiling crisis and, of course, the negotiations over the budget, which President Biden announced today. Uh, if McConnell's not here to steer that ship, that's going to be a big change for Senate Republicans. Of course, McConnell is the longest-serving leader of either party, Republican or Democrat, so they count on him to be the person that figures this out and exactly the role that Republicans play in these fierce negotiations. Yeah, and few know how the Senate works better than Senator Mitch McConnell. All right, thanks so much, Ryan. We appreciate it. We turn now to the forecast and severe winter weather stretching from coast to coast. 50 million people under wind, wind alerts from the northern plains to the northeast with thunderstorms set to slam the southeast. And in hard hit California where massive snowstorms have stranded so many. Heavy rain and high elevation snow expected to cause even more damage. We have NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns here. Bill, I'm looking over at you and I can see you're starting in California again. I, I don't know if that state has had such bad weather for so long. <laughs> Uh, this is quite the storm. The next 24 hours, we expect damage. Uh, hopefully, we're not going to have fatalities, but it's a possibility. So this is what happened today. For tomorrow, they have issued what we call a high risk of flash flooding and of flooding. These are pretty rare. They only happen about 4% of the days during an entire year. And when we get these, this is when we have the big damaging flash floods, and this is when we have the problems. About 39% of all flash flood deaths are in these high risks. And that's from Monterey down to almost Santa Maria and heading in the mountainous areas, the foothills. Fresno up into areas of the Sierra. So that's the areas of greatest concern, a huge section. And when you see the radar of California, you're like, wow, like the blue is the snow, the green is the rain, the yellow is the pouring rain. And right now, some of the heaviest of it's coming into San Francisco. And we expect this to continue tonight, tomorrow, and even into tomorrow night. So some of the rainfall totals, yes, will be one to five inches in the mountainous areas. Even the city, Santa Barbara is going to get two inches. That means the mountains outside of Santa Barbara will get four to five. So that's a possibility of flooding. We got high winds, too, that could knock out power to some of these areas. So California, the next 36 hours, very difficult. And then, Tom, you were mentioning, you know, we have a snowstorm going on under Wisconsin. Chicago northwards, a very difficult drive home tonight. We have areas under a winter storm warning around Milwaukee. That's where we get considerable snow tomorrow morning. Very difficult. Southern Michigan to Detroit, Cleveland during the day tomorrow. And then that will tomorrow night head through areas of Pennsylvania. And we will get some snow out of this just outside of New York City towards Hartford. And, Tom, I'll leave you with this. We have a chance for a nor'easter, maybe even a strong nor'easter, Tuesday next week. Be one of the first ones of the entire winter for areas of New England. I'll have much more details on that tomorrow. The first nor'easter mid-March. All right, wow. Okay, Bill, thanks for all of that. There's a lot of news tonight. We want to head back overseas to the chaos unfolding in Israel. Protesters turning out across the country, blocking major roads and airports. The demonstrations even disrupting a trip by U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. NBC's Raf Sanchez has been following this for Top Story from Tel Aviv. Tonight, Israel's deep internal divisions on full display and bringing the country to the verge of paralysis. Tens of thousands blocking highways and major roads in protest against government plans to weaken the Israeli Supreme Court. Democracy is in danger in Israel. And with demonstrators blockading the airport, a high-profile visit by U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin thrown into chaos. A one-day trip reduced to just a few hours on the ground. This is Israel's defense ministry where Secretary Austin was supposed to have his meetings. But you can see protesters have brought Tel Aviv to a complete standstill. There was no way for him to get through. Instead, Austin holding a brief meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu within the airport compound. The Israeli leader says his judicial plan, which would allow parliament to ignore Supreme Court rulings, is a badly needed reform to curb activist judges. But demonstrators told us they fear for their country's future. This country is eventually 
let's say, Jewish and, de and democratic. Right now, they're trying to take away the democratic part away. And, you know, that just brings people to the streets. Austin signaling the U.S. is also concerned. As President Biden has said, the genius of, democracy, of American democracy and Israeli democracy is that they are both built on strong institutions, on checks and balances, and on an independent judiciary. But just hours after Austin's call for calm, a terror attack in the heart of Tel Aviv. Police say a gunman opened fire on Israeli civilians, wounding three before he was killed. And this morning, Israeli forces killing three gunmen from the militant group Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Austin voicing strong U.S. support for Israel's security and condolences for Israeli victims, including these two brothers shot dead by Hamas last month, but also speaking out against inflammatory rhetoric by far-right members of Israel's government and attacks carried out by Israeli extremists. And we're especially disturbed by violence by settlers against Palestinians. The Palestinian town of Hawara repeatedly attacked by Israeli settlers who set fire to homes and businesses. This car dealership losing nearly its entire stock to the flames. A kamsayara? Me. Me, a hundred cars? Owner Sultan oh. Abu Sarif telling us, It took 20 years to build my business. It took just four hours to destroy everything. Israel's military tonight acknowledging it should have stopped the settler attacks on Hawara. But with the flashpoint holidays of Ramadan and Passover fast approaching, American hopes of restoring calm colliding with harsh reality on the ground. And earlier tonight, Israel's president, who is a largely ceremonial figure but whose words carry a lot of moral weight, said the divisions within Israel were a disaster. He called on Prime Minister Netanyahu to abandon his judicial overhaul and replace it with a compromise agreement. But so far, no sign Netanyahu is backing down. Tom? Israel appearing to be at a crossroads tonight. All right, Raf Sanchez for us. Raf, we appreciate it. Still ahead, the scare at a Chicago elementary school. Multiple students hospitalized after some kind of irritant was released into the air, what authorities believe caused it. Plus, cracking down on so-called ghost cars. Have you heard about this? Take a look. Drivers across the country removing license plates, some even using high-tech devices. The cars have even been linked to serious crime. So what happens when you crash into one of them or they crash into you? how one major U.S. city is now trying to stop it. And the investigation into Tesla, some customers reporting the steering wheels are falling off while they're on the road. Stay with us. Not a nationwide concern over missing or improper license plates that are making thousands of vehicles untraceable. Some of these quote-unquote ghost cars even allow for people to commit more serious crimes and evade authorities. NBC's George Solis explains how Philadelphia has shifted gears and how they're approaching this growing problem. Far from spooky or supernatural, the prevalence of so-called ghost cars, vehicles with either covered, obscured, or just plain fake license plates is raising red flags. It's an issue that goes beyond avoiding parking fines or cheating tolls. Federal authorities are now calling this one of the top threats in the country. In Philadelphia, the problem is so rampant, the parking authority has launched a new online campaign to make it easy for residents to report cars like these that are virtually untraceable. Why is it so important, you think, to address now? I think it's a big quality of life issue, which then leads into public safety. In fact, since the launch of the online tool nearly two weeks ago, the agency has received more than 400 reports and has towed more than 50 ghost cars, some abandoned. Others part of the growing concern about the potential use of these cars in more serious crimes. We've been seeing an uptick in that issue since I've been here only for a few months. New York City has also been trying to combat the problem. The NYPD telling NBC News it issued more than 42,000 citations for paper or covered license plates last year and made more than 5,500 arrests. A 2021 investigation by NBC New York looked into an explosion of fraudulent paper tags being used by criminals across the tri-state during the pandemic when many DMV officers offices were closed, making it easier for drivers to register cars. They would put illegitimate information or not real information on here so they wouldn't be traceable. The NYPD citing these two gangland type shootings that happened in Brooklyn and late last year in Grand Prairie, Texas. A manhunt for a suspect that police say was responsible for the death of an officer was made harder because of the use of a phony paper tag. We have fictitious tags all over the place 
and quite frankly, it cost a cop his life. Investigators turned to modern tech, high-powered cameras that allowed police to not only find their suspect, but also other cars using the same fictitious tag. Not capturing the suspect was never an option for this department. However, criminals are also getting crafty with tech. Just last year, Top Story reporting on a case out of Irvine, California, where burglary suspect used James Bond S tools to make their cars elusive to police and cameras. Never seen anything like that. It's very unique. Back in Philadelphia. Hopefully we can collaborate with other cities so that we can help. They can help tackle this issue like we've been. Officials looking to make the threat of ghost cars disappear before more tragedy strikes. All right, George Solis joins us live from Philadelphia from a parking authority yard there. So, George, you know, we can see some of those cars behind you. I, if some of those cars were, quote unquote, ghost cars, what happens to them once police sort of take them into custody? Yeah, good evening, Tom. And a a PPA officials telling me, yeah, you're right. A lot of those ghost cars are ending up in lots just like this here in the city. And for someone, a driver or the owner to come get that car, they not only need to present the right paperwork, they also need to have the right tag. But getting them out isn't cheap either. Not only do they have to pay for the citation, they also have to pay for the storage and the tow as well. Tom? Yeah, probably not in a rush to get their cars back. Uh, George, we appreciate that report. Thank you. When we come back, the major change to mammograms, the new FDA guidelines for medical providers who provide the exams and why it could potentially save more lives. Stay with us. Okay, we're back now with Top Stories News Feeding. We begin with the scare at an elementary school in Chicago. Five ambulances sent to the elementary school after reports of a harmful spray being released into the classroom. At least three children hospitalized. Police confirming the irritant was the result of a stink bomb. They're now investigating where it came from. The FDA has set a new nationwide guideline on mammograms aimed to help more people detect breast cancer. The new rules will require mammogram providers to notify people if they have dense breast tissue and recommend they consult with a doctor for any additional screenings. So far, only 38 states require providers to give people information about breast density after a mammogram, even though it could be a risk factor for cancer. U.S. auto safety regulators are officially launching an investigation to Tesla. The preliminary investigation targets 2023 Model Y vehicles after reports the steering wheels were falling off while driving. Federal regulators also looking into models S vehicles following a fatal crash in California involving a Tesla suspected of using autopilot. We want to take a turn out of the unrest in the country of Georgia. Not know if you guys have heard about this so far. Protest over the government proposing a bill that critics say will infringe on democracy. Thousands taking to the streets of the Capitol, facing down riot police who sprayed them with water cannons and tear gas. Megan Fitzgerald has more. Tonight, a fight for freedom and democracy raging in the streets of the Black Sea Nation of Georgia for the third night in a row. Police in riot gear clashing with protesters who are trying to prevent what they say are pro-Russian members of parliament from passing an anti-democratic law. The bill which the Georgian government tried to push through the parliament of Georgia basically uh, requires to register as agents everyone who receives um, some foreign funding. Salome Samadashvili is an opposition member of parliament. She says the bill mimics a law used by Russian President Vladimir Putin to suppress political opposition and independent media. Because it would be used basically to suppress democracy and freedom in our country. Russia is testing Georgia. We do not believe that this bill was written in Georgia. Georgia or that this plan to have this bill passed was something that the Georgian government came up on their own. With thousands of protesters of all ages say Russia is trying to hijack Georgian politics. The Kremlin is speaking out, saying they have absolutely nothing to do with the bill, as the Georgian parliament today withdrew the legislation after mounting pressure. But protesters aren't convinced it's dead. The decision not to pass it could be a trick, this protester said. So we need to have legally binding guarantees. Those who propose the law are responsible for this mess. The majority of Georgians want to move closer to Western society. Joining the EU and NATO is what they're fighting for. Protesters being hosed with water in cold temperatures, dispersed with tear gas and taken away in handcuffs. This, they say, is a fight for their future and one they refuse to give up. 
Tom, legislators say the bill has to go to the floor for a second vote per procedure, but that it won't pass because they won't vote for it. Protesters, on the other hand, say they won't stop until the bill is gone. Tom. All right, Megan Vichero, good to see you again. Double duty tonight for you. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and the investigation into a deadly tunnel collapse in Spain. The tunnel giving way inside a mine about 50 miles north of Barcelona. At least three people have been killed, including a geologist and two post-grad students. The mining company says one of the victims started his internship there just six days ago. The mine had just passed a safety check three weeks ago. Japanese police have arrested three people for taking part in so-called sushi terrorism. The viral challenge has people filming themselves, this is so gross, licking or touching plates of food at conveyor belt sushi restaurants, then they post it to social media. The restaurants are popular in Japan. I've been to one. They're delicious. And they say the pranks have sparked health concerns. Glad they caught them. When we come back, the push to help men battling eating disorders, why it can be harder for men to get diagnosed and treated, will bring you one family struggle next. We're back now with an issue that doesn't often get the attention it deserves, boys and eating disorders. About one in three people diagnosed with an eating disorder is a male, but experts say that number is likely much higher. Savannah Sellers has this one. At just 17 years old, Ryan has been struggling with his body image for close to a decade. It first kind of was just like, oh, I'm too big. In sixth grade, Ryan began skipping snacks and dessert. He joined the wrestling team and over the next two years started to restrict even more. There was a lot of cutting your weight to get to lower weight classes. By eighth grade, food consumed his thoughts. I was thinking about eating every day, every meal, either like guilt or, you know, dreading a meal. The change in Ryan's physical appearance was dramatic. This here is one. Freshman year. You're a lot thinner. Yeah. Still, it took years for Ryan to seek medical treatment for his eating disorder. I thought it was just a girl thing. When did you think, okay, maybe it can apply to boys too? Wouldn't be until I started treatment. Even doctors struggle to identify male patients, in part because they have no roadmap to do so. 99% of the research up until now has focused on females. Dr. Jason Nagata is an eating disorder specialist at UCSF, pushing for guidelines specifically focused on boys and men. He says no eating disorder accounts for boys trying to bulk up, and until 2020, to be diagnosed with anorexia, a person had to miss at least three periods. Especially with athletes, they're doing the exact same things that girls you know, with eating disorders are doing to try to meet these weight cutoffs but it's, it's viewed as normal because everyone on the team is doing it. Ryan's mom, Carrie, never saw this coming. I really thought, oh, I'm going to have to deal with this with my daughter. And it ended up being Ryan. It just, that was very surprising. Were you scared? Yeah, oh yeah, very scared. I would try to go online, go to the library, get books about boys with eating disorders, and there was nothing. After an extensive search, Carrie found Newport Healthcare, where Ryan completed a 60-day inpatient program last year. I still battle with the thoughts on a daily basis, but I have so many coping skills now that I've learned through treatment. He also has a message to other boys. As a young boy, you want to be really masculine, and you don't want to show any weakness. But really what makes you strong is realizing your own weaknesses and fighting them. Savannah Sellers, NBC News. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.